Hello everyone joining us, whether uh, through Zoom or through Instagram. Um, I am Dr. Ahmed Hamoud, consultant pediatric neurologist at American Wellness Center. Today, our topic is gonna be about autism, okay? Uh, and the title is called The Enigma of Autism. So wh what is enigma in general? In enigma, if, if I want to tell you the definition, it's something that is mysterious and seems impossible to understand completely. And this is exactly what autism is. It's something that we know about, we see a lot, we try to treat, but yet it's still an enigma for us. So those who are watching us on Instagram, if they want to see the slides, they can join the Zoom meeting. Uh, and those on Zoom will see us and see uh, the slides. So our outline today, we're gonna discuss what is autism, uh, what is the cause of autism, the role of the pediatric neurologist, and what is the treatment, if there's a treatment for autism. To start with the DSM-5 manual, which defines autism spectrum disorder as, and this is, keep in mind, this is a very complicated uh, definition. And I'm gonna read what they say, and then I'm gonna try to simplify it in a way that we really understand what is autism. So according to DSM-5, they state that autism is persistent difficulties with social communication and social interaction. Also, there is restricted and repetitive pattern of behaviors, activities, or interests. This includes sensory behavior, and these behaviors are present since early childhood. These behaviors are excessive to, the, to an extent that they limit or impair everyday functioning. So if we take a look, if we try to grasp what this uh, definition is about, we, we can't really fully understand what they mean. So when we try to simplify it, we say it's simple. Autism is three things. One, you have a problem in verbal communication. The child does not speak. And when I say communication, I do not mean only that he does not speak, but also he does not understand what we're telling him. So communication is a two-way thing. Not only he cannot express or say what they want, they do not understand what we are telling them. So first, there's a problem in verbal communication. Second, there's problem in nonverbal communication. What is nonverbal communication? It's when we try, let's take an example, someone who does not speak, they can, or like the deaf mute, they can communicate in sign language. Autistic children don't even know how to use their body language to tell you what they want. It can be in the form of, you call them by their name, they do not respond to name. When you talk to them, there is no eye contact and sim something as simple as pointing to what they want, they do not know how to do. So problems in verbal communication, problems in nonverbal communication, and the repetitive movements that we discussed are called stereotypical behavior. Sometimes we call them stimming, and it, is, it can be in the form of flapping when they are in distress, tiptoe walking, it can be they cover their ears when they are scared. So these are stereotypical behavior that they do on a regular basis, try to express certain emotion that they do not know how to express otherwise. One key point I need to discuss is not only for parents, but also for physicians, and it is autism versus ADHD, okay? And this is something I, I really cannot stress enough. I've seen a lot of children present to me, either the parents tell me or the doctor referring them, telling me, well, this is a case of ADHD, and the end result, I see a child who is autistic. So keep in mind, most of the parents or physicians say ADHD based on the hyperactivity, okay? So regardless of hyperactivity or any other symptoms that can be like common between ADHD and autism, the key difference is the communication problem. And this is the turning point. So whether or not the child is communicating or not, you can have a hyperactive child communicates well, 
then I tell you, yeah, it's probably ADHD. But you have, if you have a hyperactive child and you cannot reach out to them, you cannot communicate with them, then probably this is autism spectrum disorder. And keep in mind, not every autistic child is the same. That's why it's a spectrum. So whenever you have a problem with communication, this means this child can be on the spectrum. So what are the causes of autism? Do we actually know the causes of autism? Well, there's a lot of theories and a lot of hypotheses, but till now, we still do not clearly know what cause causes autism. Now, genetics is one of the things that are being is being studied. Okay, so scientists have found rare genes, uh, changes or mutations, as well as small common gene variations in the people having autism, implying a genetic component. Yet there has been reported cases of identical twins. One is autistic and the other is not. So this cannot be 100% genetic because identical twins are the same person split in half. The same genetic material is present in the same two and in two individuals. So it cannot be a specific mutation caused autism in one and not caused in the other. So it's not strictly genetic. While several chromosomes and genetic location has been linked to ASD or autism, there is very little evidence to suggest that one of these is solely responsible for the cause of autism. This has led researchers to suggest that ASD is caused by complex interactions between several genes, which led to difference uh, on a number of different biological levels. Okay, we know for a fact that 40% of children with autism, we can actually find a genetic mutation, but that leaves 60% with no clear cause. So to straightforward say that genetics is what causes autism, this is really undermining the whole thing. It's not, it's not enough or it's, there's no complying evidence that suggests that only genetics leads to autism. A numerous number of hypotheses, and definitely any parent who's had an autistic child and like they've been going from one place to another, one doctor to another, one Google search to another, they'll find a lot of hypotheses, a lot of different hypotheses, whether it's due to vaccines, whether it's diet or gut microflora, whether it's heavy metal toxicity, or etc. All I want to say is. All these that like theories that we think cause autism do not have evidence to actually confirm that this is what is causing autism. One of the theories that's still being studied and not discussed enough is something called synaptic pruning. And what is synaptic pruning? Synaptic pruning in general, the word pruning, if we want to define it, is the process of, and this is used in gardening, when you have like a tree and you want to cut the branches of the tree, the excess branches. So it is the process of selectively cutting individual branches, okay? You have a tree and there's a lot of branches and you want to shape it properly, so you cut the excess. This is called pruning. The synapses in our brain, which are the connections between the neurons, sometimes our brain during development will have an excess of synapse. Our body's job is to prune or cut the excess uh, uh, synapses. If this does not happen, then this is one of the theories that people are such or doctors are suggesting that could this be the cause of autism? Okay, because synaptic pruning is a natural process that occurs in brain in the brain between childhood and adulthood. During synaptic pruning, the brain eliminates extra synapses. Synapses are brain structures, as we said, that allow the neurons to transmit an electrical or chemical signal to other neurons. So the brain cell is called a neuron. Between two brain cells, they connect via something called uh, synapses. Synaptic pruning is thought to be the brain's way of removing connections in the brain that are no longer needed. So you ask yourself a question, what if they remain? Researchers have recently learned that the brain is more plastic than and moldable than we previously thought. That in the past we thought, okay, this is the brain, well, this is it. No, now we're knowing that it goes on to undergo 
process in which plasticity and molding of the brain and changes occurring to the brain during childhood into adulthood, and this will cause different, different outcomes. Synaptic pruning in, is our body's way of maintaining a more efficient brain function. And as we get older and we learn diff complex information, this will improve who, who, the brain structure, the synapses, and who we are in the future. Neurons and synapses begin the, to form uh, during the early stages of, uh, of the embryo's development, starting from within the, the uterus of the mother. From this point until a person is approximately uh, two years old, new neurons and synapses from uh, form at an extremely fast rate. Uh, it's like it's about forty thousand new synapses may occur every second. At the end of this stage of development, when a person is around two years old, they have far more neurons and synapses than they will function in it. As infants learn and grow, their experiences strengthen the synapses that they need and will get rid of those that they do not need. Other synapses in the brain will then weaken and fade. Synaptic pruning is the natural process where the brain eliminates extra synapses. This helps form a healthy and adaptive brain. And this is something, and this age group specifically, two years of age, Parents with autistic children, because we've heard a lot of, of parents telling the same story, we feel like they undergo the same progress or the same uh, development of autism. What they usually say is that the child is somewhat okay till the age of one year, one year and a half. And after the age of one year and a half, they start feeling, till the age of two, they start feeling that the child is developing these autistic features. So here is the theory that could it be that the pruning to remove excess synapses was not occurring and the excess in synapses till the age of two years without pruning caused these symptoms? This is one of the theories. There are several studies now trying to uh, identify this cause of, of like the fault, a fault in pruning. And one of these studies is studying something called mTOR-related synaptic pathology, that it might be the cause of autism. And they are undergoing studies on mice, try to see if mTOR-related synaptic pathology, which really prevent synaptic pruning is the cause. And if we treat this mTOR related synapses, could there be a treatment and could there be hope in treating children with autism? Uh, they, they did post-mortem studies on mice that had uh, increased excitatory synapses in the brain uh, and symptoms similar to autism. So they managed to make mice have symptoms similar to autism. And they noticed that this was induced by uh, having an mTOR, an abnormal mTOR functioning. mTOR overactivity in these mice, uh, observe, they observed that there was an increase in density of, uh, of synapse in those uh, uh, mice who had autistic uh, symptoms. So at the same time, we're discussing this. So there has been studies trying to see that if mTOR inhibitors, medication that will affect the mTOR, will it really improve the symptoms? Well, they've tried on mice, they have questionable results. Some uh, mice showed improvement in symptoms, but the others not. So this is still something being studies and, uh, studied and like data is still formulating about this topic. So now what is the role of us doctors and specifically pediatric neurologists? So what is our role? Our role, the role of pediatric neurologists is to rule out first any genetic syndrome, because as we said, 40% of the autistic children have certain genetic mutation associated. So if we need to really remove the cause or really get to the cause, then 40% have a genetic uh, cause, we go and test genetically, try to figure out if there's anything wrong here. And then our role is to help to make the right diagnosis. As we said, most of these children that I see either come because of ADHD or the parents say delayed speech or any other symptom, but eventually when I see them, I tell them, okay, these children are on the spectrum. And our role 
is to educate the parents. Our role is not to reassure parents at all. When parents come to us, they come because they feel something is wrong with their child. It's, and they hope, and I, I completely understand, they hope that I tell them there is nothing. But my role is not to reassure you if there is something. Our role is to educate you on what needs to be done. I could, I could say whatever you want. I can make you list sugarcoat the diagnosis and you will feel good about yourself and your child, but in the long run, I would have hurt you. Our role is to educate you on what we have here and how to manage. And then if we need to refer to therapies, we should start therapies. And if medication is needed, then we can give medication. And I'll talk a little bit in the end about the medication. Now, if I want to say talk about genetic syndromes, I'm mean, I want to give examples about genetic syndromes. So what, what is autism and genetic syndromes? We have a lot of genetic syndromes or genetic mutations that can cause autism, okay? Uh, there's a lot, uh, but I'm gonna discuss two of these genetic sy uh, syndromes. Uh, one associated with males and one associated with females. The first one is fragile X syndrome. Fragile X syndrome is a genetic disorder due to an X chromosome that is abnormal. Okay, we know that the male has an X and Y, so an abnormal X will make the symptoms appear more. Whereas in females, they have another X that's normal and the symptoms are often less uh, visible. Okay, what are the symptoms? If I see a boy, with autistic features, okay? Mild mental retardation, large ears and large testicles, then I highly suspect fragile X syndrome. And here I need to do a genetic test to confirm the diagnosis, okay? So this is one of, and keep in mind, the genetic test is just to confirm the diagnosis and set expectations, not more. It doesn't have to be that there's a treatment all the time. The other syndrome that affects mainly females, the genetic syndrome, is something called Rett syndrome. And the Rett syndrome is a different type of mutation. It's mainly in a, in a genetic mutation called MECP2 gene mutation. Rett syndrome, usually we have girls who are microcephalic, which means their head is small, uh, they have seizures, they have autistic features, and they have specifically abnormal hand movement, or we call them hand wringing movements. They cannot control their hand, and sometimes as the disease progresses, it will affect their walking and they will be wheelchair bound. Okay. Now, what is the treatment of autism? Okay. There is no magic pill for autism. It's not like I can give you this, take this pill go and your child will be okay. And if someone tells you they have a treatment for autism, please double check if they are really like factual or not, okay? Because there's a lot of people out there willing to make money out of people who are desperate to treat their children. So what I say usually, the first thing we need to do is we need to change the lifestyle. The first thing we need to do is stop screens, okay? TVs, uh, uh, phones, tablets, whatever, uh, stop screens. It's not that the screens cause autism, but it has been shown that someone who has the tendency to develop autism, their symptoms will worsen if they are spend a lot of time on screens. That's why according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, children aged from zero to two years should get zero time of screens from two to five years, 30 minutes of screen time, and above five years, they can watch as much as they want. So first of all, stop screens. Second, it is put in a nursery. When you put the child in a nursery, children learn from each other. They will first start responding to name because their friends are responding to their names. They will be socialized and start working as groups. This will help them a lot in developing and improving. And third of third thing we need to do, and I always say it, is therapies, therapies, and then therapies. We need to do a lot of therapies. I know it might be expensive, but there is no other way. There is no actual data that shows improvement of, of autistic children uh, with more evidence than therapies, okay? And the therapies are like speech therapy, occupational therapy, and behavioral therapy. A lot of evidence-based, sorry, a lot of non-evidence-based medicine is being practiced all over the world. 
okay? Whether it's, uh, let me give you this medication, let's take this vitamin, strict, to do this, do that, diet. Uh, 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 let me give you something that will get rid of the heavy metals. There are a lot of theories and a lot of things you can find online, but not everything is evidence-based, okay? So please double check because this topic is very, very debatable. So what about medication? Because like certain, definitely some people know that we as doctors give, give treatment to, if we said that there's no medication that treats autism, then one, why are we giving medication for autism? So we give medication for autism to help with the symptoms. It's really a symptomatic treatment of the symptom they have, okay? It's not actually to treat the disease, it's to, like if you have fever, you're gonna give like a paracetamol to lower the fever with treating symptoms, okay? So if, if the child is very aggressive, has a lot of like tantrums, whatever, we can go with antipsychotics, atypical antipsychotics, like risperidone or eripiprazole. If the child is older and now they're more into like uh, depression or they have a severe OCD, uh, then we can go with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or antidepressants. Uh, ADHD management or ADHD treatment should be used with caution because, uh, as we said, some similarities with ADHD, but it's not your typical ADHD. And some children with autism may, may, may have aggravation of symptoms or only see side effects rather than see the positive effects of ADHD, of ADHD treatment. So please, 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 before using any of this treatment, see a pediatric neurologist and they, he'll tell you what to do, okay? What are the potential treatment options? As we said, they are trying the mTOR inhibitors, like Vigabatrin, like uh, Everolimus, other treatments that are being used for uh, as mTOR inhibitors. There are also, there's a treatment uh, called DABU. Its, it's formulation is trophenetide. And this has been used now for red syndrome. The, the syndrome we said that the females present with autism and it's showing improvement in symptoms. Yet, till now, it's not be, being studied on, on, on autistic children, but there's a plan to study that treatment on autistic children. There are also other medications, metformin, uh, cannabidiol, which are the derivatives of uh, marijuana. And there's a lot of, of other supplements also being uh, studied, like n but still no ground or no solid evidence that suggests one is better than the other. And I've seen a lot of children who, who underwent stem cell transplantation. And please, so far, we have no evidence on stem cell transplantation. Don't, it's, it's a risky procedure. And might, you might put your child at risk of, of, of serious complications and even like death. Please consider what you're, please think through what you want to do to your child before going through certain procedures. As a conclusion, Autism still does not have a clear cause. Autism can present as a part of genetic syndrome, but most cases are idiopathic. Idiopathic that means we do not know the cause of this, uh, of, of, of autism. Uh, the pediatric neurologist's role is to confirm the presence of autism, any associated symptoms, the need of medication, educate the parents and refer to therapy. To therapist, and as I I say it again, therapies is the best option you have. Therapies, therapies, and therapies. Till now, therapies are the cornerstone of the management of autism, and the only management that has evidence-based clinically significant results. In the future, as we said, with synaptic pruning, probably the management of autism will not be treatment. Probably the management of autism is if we know what's causing it, it can be prevented. And if autism can be prevented, then probably, and ironically, there might be in the future a vaccine that the mother would take that would prevent the child to have autism, okay? So keep in mind, there are a lot of things that we uh, might understand wrongly based on misinformation on the internet, it's better to see a pediatric neurologist, better to have him see the child, and the best option we have till now is to do therapies. Thank you. Uh, I'll be checking for, um, for questions. Uh, okay, I, I have questions. 
Um, so what, one question is, uh, I have only one child and he is diagnosed with autism. I am afraid if I have another child, they might be, okay, they might develop autism as well. Is it connected to genetics? So as, as we said, uh, there's definitely a genetic element, but not a clear gene that would cause autism, okay? Uh, if someone has a child who is autistic, the probability of having another child with autism is higher, but none, we cannot say 100% they will have autism, unless we have a clear genetic mutation isolated with the previous child, let's say in fragile X syndrome, then we know that there's a possibility and I can I calculate the probability of having a child with, with the same uh, genetic disease. Another question is sometimes parents lose hope and get mentally uh, frustrated while dealing with a ch an autistic child. I, I can totally understand that. And they think their child will never be normal. Uh, what would you suggest for these parents? So definitely, as we said, autism is, is a spectrum. We have mild autism, we have moderate, we have severe. And like, the good thing is most of the cases that we're seeing are mild to moderate, okay? And these mild to moderate cases, 20% of mild autistic children have the possibility of losing the diagnosis, which means if received in therapy early on, they will eventually communicate, improve, and lose all the criteria that will like identify them. If someone is doing the questionnaire for autism, okay? And, and let's say at the age of two years, they were autistic. If treated properly and they improve, the repeat of this of this questionnaire will, will end up saying there is no autism. So this means they will lose the diagnosis. So always, always keep hope, okay? There is a high possibility of improvement, normalization up to 20% of the cases. So what we need to do is acknowledge the fact that there is a problem and try to deal with this problem early on to prevent uh, uh, complications in the future because the older the children get, the more difficult it is to, to do therapies for them and show uh, see improvement. The last question I have here is, can an autistic child go to regular school or are there special education centers for them? And this is similar to, to what, what, what we need, uh, what we have as, as an autistic child, where do we see mild, moderate, or severe? If it's mild and showing great improvement, then he can go to regular school. If it's moderate, uh, mild to moderate, then they probably have a shadow teacher or within a regular school have them. But see, definitely severe cases sometimes need to be in a special uh, center where they can not only get educated, but also have the therapies done on board. Okay, uh, I have the question on Zoom. What are the signs that an autistic child um, improved post therapies? Okay, so what are the signs that really tell us this child is improving? Let's say I see a child and the first time I see him, there is no eye contact. There is no, he's non-verbal, no speech at all. He does not respond to name. He does not point. And let's say he goes to therapies and after like few months of therapy, and keep in mind, this that therapies is not like a one day or a, like a, a month thing it's it's a continuous and a rigorous regime that should be done to see improvement so in the follow-up visit let's say three months later six months later i can notice this child has better eye contact they are responding better to name they are pointing they are starting to express what they want verbally so these are all signs of improvement and with time, they will acquire more and more speech and more and more have the ability to express themselves. And this will decrease the stereotypical behavior and decrease the tantrums and the frustration they have. Do we have any questions on Instagram? No. Any other questions on Zoom? If not, I think I'll end it here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you next time with another lecture. Okay, stay safe. Bye-bye.